Let's pray as we stand. Heavenly Father, thank you that this morning we can gather together and sing of your amazing love. Thank you that you sent your Son from heaven to be stripped of all majesty and to serve us. Would you speak to us by your Spirit this morning, we pray, and give us soft hearts as we listen to your voice. Amen. Please take a seat. Seven. 0.6 0.6 billion views. Cleaning has never been more popular. As of February 2021, that is how many times people had viewed videos on just one popular social media platform that contained the hashtag cleaning. Uh, if you have the urge to see something cleaned, but you can't be bothered to do it yourself, then you can watch people deep clean phones, laptops, games consoles. Uh, You can watch people deep clean swimming pools, deep clean ovens and hobs, deep clean bathrooms, deep clean patios, deep clean cars, deep clean, well, just about anything. Uh, In fact, watching cleaning videos online has become so popular that it's seen the growing emergence of people on the internet called cleaning influencers, or for the initiated among us, cleanfluencers. Yes, that's a real term. Uh, They will put up videos of themselves cleaning online and who may even be paid to promote particular cleaning products by big businesses as a way to influence you and me into seeing the cleaning power their products possess. In fact, the cleaning market has become so lucrative that leading cleanfluencers are said to earn up to £10,000 for every cleaning post they put on Instagram. Sociologists have suggested that cleanfluencers have become so popular because they educate their viewers by helping them see the cleaning problems they didn't even know existed in their lives. And then they provide the knowledge of how they can clean those problems away. And they also give their viewers a greater motivation to get their houses clean and in order by showing them the benefits and potential of a clean space. But cleanfluencers offer their wisdom at a distance. Uh, Through a screen, without judgment, uh, they never have to see or even get involved in your mess, simply allowing you to clean yourself up. And ultimately, the videos clean fluences produce are said to be soul-soothing as the viewer watches someone else bring order to chaos. And if you're anything like me, these videos can be quite satisfying to watch. Uh, There is something about watching someone take something that was grubby and dirty and restore it and wash it clean. Uh, There's almost something spiritual about it. And for many of us today, as absurd as it may first seem, we treat Jesus as if he was a cleanfluencer. Uh, Many people's experiences of church or Christianity have been seeing Jesus presented as a cleanfluencer in practice, uh, simply without the title. Uh, Let me explain a little bit. Uh, We might come to church on a Sunday, and as the Bible is opened up, we might be educated to see all the ways in which we have sinned and fallen short of God's standard. Uh, So we go home, and that week, having seen the problems in our life exposed, we work really hard uh, to scrub ourselves up for God. Or perhaps we spend time looking at Jesus' life uh, on earth in our quiet times, We see his brilliant, pure example, and this motivates us to go away, uh, to work hard to be more like him, uh, to pull our socks up, grit our teeth, and get on with the process of improving ourselves. Or perhaps we treat Jesus as someone who can help us to live our lives in a better way, a nicer way, a more spiritual way, but at a distance. At our clean fluence to Jesus Uh, It's a Jesus that gives us some really good tips, tricks, life hacks for improving our day-to-day lives. But if it's a tip or trick too far that we don't particularly like, well, then we can just close the screen, close our Bibles, and stop listening. So as we come to John chapter 13 this morning, where there is a great amount of cleaning going on, I want us to think about this question. Are we supposed to treat Jesus like a cleanfluencer? Uh, This morning, we're carrying on our series in the life of Peter, and Peter is incredibly well-placed to help us answer this question. 
By the time our passage takes place, Peter has gone through a lot with Jesus. Uh, We've seen a little bit of that these past two weeks. He's seen Jesus perform countless miracles, say many wise things. And by the time of our passage, Peter's been around Jesus for roughly three years. He's one of Jesus' closest disciples. And so if anyone can help us to know whether we're legitimately supposed to view Jesus as a clean influencer, then it's him. We have three points this morning, uh, and each of them contain the word wash, but they all end with a different suffix. So our first point is this, the washer. Since I started uh, working for Cornerstone last summer, Mondays have become my day off, my time. And in my time, I might watch some Netflix, play some PlayStation, read a book in the garden, and I try and play football in the evenings. But Mondays are also when I tend to do my share of the cleaning in the house. It tends to be the day I do a clothes wash. I might catch up on some of the washing up left over from Sunday. I know I'll be doing that tomorrow. And I'll put out the bins in the evening. But if you gave me the choice between the two, at resting or cleaning, then I would much rather spend my time in bed watching a cleaning video rather than actually having to do any real cleaning myself because when I want to be, I can be quite selfish and lazy. But the wonderful thing we see in our passage this morning is what we see about how selflessly Jesus chooses to spend his time and therefore what our passage tells us of the character of Jesus. Let's look again at verses 1 to 5. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. It's just before Passover. The hour for Jesus to leave the world and return to the Father has arrived. If you're familiar with John's gospel, then the hour is John's consistent reference to Jesus' death. Jesus knows that in just 24 hours' time uh, onwards from John chapter 13, he will have been beaten and mocked, and he'll have been raised up on a cross to be killed. I don't even want to clean the house in my time. And yet, though he knows he only has 24 hours left to live, 24 hours left of his time, Jesus chooses to use the final hours of his life, loving his disciples to the very end, as he spends the last hours of his life serving his disciples by washing their feet in loving humility. Uh, You might be forgiven for wondering how, in our passage, washing feet is this particularly great act of love. Uh, It doesn't tend to come up in uh, the world of love languages. It's probably not what first comes to our minds as a loving act. Because washing feet isn't a particularly big part of our culture today, is it? It's not something we'd tend to do for dinner guests that come to our home, even when they do have smelly feet. But in the culture of the day, it was commonplace. The disciples and Jesus would have been walking through the dirty, sandy, dusty streets of the first century Middle East in sandals. So when they arrived at someone's house, their feet would be filthy and in need of a wash. Common etiquette would be that someone would wash their feet before the meal began. But it was such a lowly task that it would often be reserved for the lowest member of the household, often only a job considered for a slave. But John writes in verse 2 that the evening meal is already in progress, and yet no foot washing has taken place. Not one of the disciples has taken it upon themselves to show their love for Jesus by offering to wash his feet, nor the feet of their peers. They're unwilling to throw off their status, their self-respect, and they're unwilling to humble themselves to take on the position of a servant. So what does Jesus do? Verse 3, 
Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The big difference between Jesus and a clean fluencer is that he offers not a product or a technique, but he offers himself. It's important as we meet Jesus in the scriptures that we don't come looking for how we can scrub ourselves up, how we can better ourselves, because that's not the point. Rather, we should come looking for Jesus himself, because he is the one who does the cleaning. Jesus, their rabbi, their teacher, Jesus, the one with all things under his power, the one who had come from God and was returning to God, became their washer. He loved his disciples to the end as he assumed the position of a servant. And with only 24 hours left before he would be killed, Jesus showed his true colors, his true character, as he chose to wash the feet of his proud disciples even washing the feet of Judas, the one who would betray him in just a matter of hours. I wonder if this morning we need to be reminded that what we see of the character of Jesus in this passage is what we see of the character of God. That the character of God is not just to love his own some of the way or most of the way home until they do something really bad and he gives, his up, gives up on them, but to love his own to the end. Or maybe you've begun to view God as a harsh taskmaster. As someone who's always asking more of your time, your energy, your money. Someone who's never quite happy with you. And instead is just constantly giving you more and more hoops to jump through. Let this passage remind you that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve Let's remind ourselves this morning that our God is mighty. He has all authority and power. And yet his character is to use all that authority and power to assume the position of a lowly servant washer. Jesus doesn't just provide a how-to video on YouTube. Instead, he comes in person. He gets his hands dirty. And he sets about cleaning up the mess that our sin has made. Point two, the washing. In verses six to 11, uh, John provides us with what we can only sum up as a typically Peter encounter. In the gospel accounts, Peter is often the loud mouth of Jesus' group of disciples. And we see this again here. Uh, The other disciples, by the end of verse five, have already had their feet washed. And whilst they might have felt a bit uncomfortable letting their Lord and master wash their feet, They've remained silent, letting Jesus get on with his work. But in verse 6, Jesus arrives at Peter's feet, and Peter is adamant, this this is all wrong. And he's the kind of person that can't help but say so. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. There's lots of reasons, many reasons why Peter might not want Jesus to wash his feet, but almost certainly it's that he knows Jesus is so much greater than he is. And he knows it should be him washing Jesus' feet, not the other way around. And I think Peter's response here is a window into the heart of each of us today. And what we see is a deeply religious heart. Peter thinks that following Jesus is all about what he can do for Jesus. But Jesus shows Peter that to follow him is really about allowing Jesus to constantly shower him in service and grace. Every other world religion operates on the principle of works, what we can do for God. 
But when Jesus comes to earth, he absolutely shatters that misconception. He flips it totally upside down. And yet as Christians, it is so easy to begin by being served by Jesus and then slip back into our natural religious mindset. that Faith is all about fixing ourselves. And it's this mindset that sucks every ounce of joy out of the Christian life. Sure, we let the expert come in for the deep clean, but then we reckon we can keep up with the week by week sprucing up. Maybe this morning, that's how you're feeling. After a pandemic, your relationship with God has become stale, joyless, and tiring. If I can confess for a moment, that is my natural disposition, pandemic or not. A joy in the Lord is not something that comes naturally to me, And even if I feel great joy in the Lord, it's unlikely to show itself on my face. And I slip into a religious mindset so easily. For me, I daily need to be reminded that to follow Jesus is to let him serve me. And to remind myself of his washing of me that has made me clean. Because when I remind myself that my service of him flows out from his service of me, then I find myself having a much richer, more enduring joy in him. And rather than reluctantly serving him, I find myself serving him all the more energetically and willingly, rather than being consumed by all of the ways in which I fall short. As we joyfully spend time in the word, we will be regularly reminded that our service for the Lord should always flow out from remembering his service for us. Jesus goes on to say that though Peter doesn't really understand what Jesus' washing means yet, he will later. After Jesus has died and risen again, and after Jesus has put his spirit into Peter and the other disciples, then he will understand the full significance of what Jesus is doing in John chapter 13. But for now, Peter doesn't understand. And so he's adamant, Jesus will not wash his feet. No, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. The criteria to have a part with Jesus today is the same. We need to come to Jesus and ask him to wash us to wash you from all the wrong things you've done in your life that have made you dirty in his sight. To admit you can't wash yourself clean and you need him to clean you. It's a humbling, intimate position to be in because this passage shows us we can't treat Jesus like some sort of clean fluence of God that we can hold at a distance through a screen. But instead, it means that we have to come to him as a filthy little toddler who needs their dad to clean them of the mess they've created for themselves. This morning, we need to humble ourselves before Jesus, the servant washer. Stop trying to wash yourself clean for God. Put down your spiritual loofah and instead come to Jesus dirty as you are and receive the washing he offers for all the sin that has made you dirty. Peter eventually does this himself. I love the way in which Peter suddenly goes from, you shall never wash my feet, to wash all of me, not just my feet, but my hands, my head as well, any other parts of me that are unclean. And he does this just a few, just after Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. It's it's clear, Peter really wants a part with Jesus. And so he submits to his washing. But then Jesus' response is a little bit confusing. Let's look again at verses 8 to 11. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, 
though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. Uh, The foot washing in our passage is a wonderful picture of the ultimate washing that Jesus provides through his death on the cross. But it is only a picture. Notice both Peter and Judas have their feet washed in this passage. But it's clear from verse 10 10 and 11 that though Peter is clean, having submitted to Jesus' washing, Judas is not. Both had their feet washed by Jesus. And yet only one of them is cleansed. Don Carson helpfully explains this when he writes, Washed Judas may have been, cleansed he was not. Real cleansing is effected both through Jesus' revelatory word and through the atoning sacrifice to which the foot washing pointed. It is by submitting to Jesus' words and trusting in Jesus' death on the cross where we receive our permanent, once-for-all washing. That is where we receive the spiritual bath Jesus talks about in verse 10 that makes us perfectly clean in God's sight. Peter had trusted in Jesus and been bathed in redemption, but Judas had not. But for those of us like Peter, uh, who have come to Jesus to be cleansed, those of us that have come to him and received our spiritual bath, uh, we still continue to sin and dirty ourselves, don't we? Peter certainly did. As Christians who have undergone Jesus' washing, we will need washing again and again. We will need to continue to humbly submit to Christ and to receive his forgiveness. James Boyce clarifies these verses for us when he writes, Peter is a justified person and therefore needs only cleansing from the contaminating effects of sin and not pardon from sin's penalty. Verse 10 says we need to continue regularly coming to Christ to confess our sins, have our feet washed. But the reason we do this isn't because the cross hasn't washed us well enough. We are still clean in God's sight if we are in Christ, even when we sin. Jesus' death on the cross is sufficient. But instead, we confess our sins to God in order to keep our consciences clear. Uh, to be reminded that though we have sinned time and time again, our relationship with God can remain unhindered because of the cleansing we have received at the cross. Uh, It's 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9 in action. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Peter originally hadn't wanted the washing Jesus offered, but Jesus made it so clear he needed it. Peter then wanted to tell Jesus, oh, maybe this is how you could do the washing. Jesus told him the way that he would conduct the washing would be sufficient. Peter would go on to continue sinning for the rest of his life. He would deny Jesus in just a few hours' time, and he would go on to get himself dirty in so many countless ways. And though Peter would be bathed in Jesus' blood at the cross and made clean only through that, he would continue needing to have his feet washed regularly as he confessed his sin before God. The same is true for us. We need to humble ourselves before the servant washer and submit ourselves daily to his washing. Our third and final point, the washed. I hope so far this morning we've been able to see through Peter's eyes that though Jesus is very much in the cleaning business, he is no clean fluencer. Uh, Jesus doesn't motivate us to clean ourselves from afar No, instead, the real Jesus is a Jesus who steps down into a filthy world, a Jesus who cannot be held at a distance through a screen, but instead who comes uncomfortably close to us 
as he gets his hands dirty by washing us himself. The whole digital cleaning phenomenon is essentially self-centered. I watched YouTube to find out how to clean up my life, my house, and so on. I follow the clean fluencer insofar as they help me, serve me. But I hope in this final section of our passage, by contrast, we'll see that our response to Jesus is radically others-centered. Let's look at verse 12 to 17. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. If we've allowed Jesus to wash us clean, if we can count ourselves as one of the washed, we do not need to put our time and our energy into getting our house in order. Uh, We're freed from the need to scrub and graft over and over to clean ourselves because Jesus has done the work for us. That's that's very freeing. Uh, It frees us to give of ourselves to others. Uh, Some churches throughout history and even today have taken Jesus' words here that we are to wash one another's feet literally. Uh, But the majority haven't. Because when Jesus says that he has set us an example that we are to follow, most churches have understood this as a call to imitate Jesus in his service of others, uh, but not in in his cleaning. Uh, We could very easily begin regular, literal foot washing at Cornerstone to put Jesus' words here into practice. Uh, If you're particularly keen or convinced that we should, then please talk to one of the elders. But I hope that we can see that Putting Jesus' humble, servant-hearted example into practice, that is a harder and arguably higher calling than regularly washing one another's feet. We might begin washing each other's feet here on a Sunday, and I'm sure it would teach us a great deal about humility. But you can imagine how quickly that would become yet another tick box exercise. But if we're not called to literally wash one another's feet and instead to put Jesus' humble, servant-hearted example into practice, that is a hard box to tick because it's a call on every aspect of our lives, all of the time. It's a call to turn away from religion, from striving and scrubbing, and to accept the gracious cleansing of Christ, which frees us as those that have been washed to respond by following Jesus' example in service and love of others. Because Jesus, the Son of God, gave up his status, his rights, in order to assume the position of a lowly servant washer, it means that we are free to follow his example. Many of you have great status or reputation in the world, in the workplace. But by following Jesus' example, it helps us to serve those rather than lord it over. We get to serve those that the world might consider beneath us. Because Jesus was willing to humble himself to perform a lowly, humble task that should have been beneath him, We are free to follow his example on a Sunday and serve his church in any way that's needed, even if we consider a task not worthy of our gifts, our time, or our talents. We do it because we want to follow Jesus' example. Because Jesus gave up his rights, we are free to serve our church family by giving up our rights. If it will mean serving benefiting others in our congregation and in the, in the light of the pandemic what a, what a time to be called to do that 
all of these things are things that Peter (laughs) needed to learn and would take a long time to learn. And they're things that we need to learn ourselves. So let me pray that we would do that. Father God, thank you for Jesus, our servant washer. Thank you that you offer sinners like us a washing so that we might be free from sin and made clean. Father, for those of us who still feel dirty this morning, but who have trusted in your son, would you help us to feel clean, to feel washed today? Would you help those of us who have submitted to your washing to follow your example by serving those around us? Show us how we can best do that by your spirit. We pray all of this in the name of your precious son, Jesus. Amen.